So today we will discuss uh, some aspects of uh, wire and wiring and interconnect engineering in chips and uh, you know just a 3D perspective of uh, how the wiring looks in a chip where you have wires in different layers of metal and then uh, modern chips can have up to 9 layers of metal and the lowest layer is me called metal 1 and the numbering goes from there metal 2, metal 3, metal 9 Metal 1 and 2 and 3 are basically used for local interconnection, you know, connecting transistors together in a small region. The higher level, la higher layer metals are basically used to connect between different logic groups across the chip. <coughs> and the layers are interconnected through these vertical connections called vias. Essentially, those are holes which are made and then they are filled with metal. And that allows for connection between the different layers. So the wires are modeled as basically resistors and capacitors and then whenever you have very high speed operation where you have very high frequency content and very low resistance wires you also have to consider inductance. So as you know the resistance of a wire is basically resistivity times length by area cross sectional area. So if I have a wire of length L, height is H and width is W, the cross sectional area is W times H. So resistance is rho L by W H. And the, the capacitance of the wire, here Cox, we, we used the terminology of Cox in the previous uh, lectures to represent the oxide, gate oxide capacitance. Here Cox is in this slide is just referring to the vertical capacitance between the metal to the bottom plate that is epsilon ox which is Kox times epsilon 0, Kox is the relative permittivity of the material, epsilon 0 is the dielectric constant of air or vacuum. WL is the area by the thickness X ox. Okay. Similarly, the inter capacitance between me metals in the same layer is this, where you have the area of the vertical plate because we are talking of capacitance between these two wires. So, the area is HL, separation is LS, so this is what it is. There is a concept of resistance per square which is very useful. Uh, because the thickness of the wires is something which is fixed, different layers, the thickness is fixed by the foundry. So as an engineer, as a designer, you have control over the, the widths and the lengths. Also a lot of times lengths is also, you know, you can with architectural changes, you can try to get micro architectural changes. You can try to put things closer to try to reduce length. But once you have a certain length, the only thing you, are, you can play around with, the, there are two things you can play around with. The width of the wire, well three things, the width of the wire, the layer of the metal to you, you want to use and the spacing with adjacent wires. Especially you have a bus, maybe there are 16 bits, 32 bits or 4 bits or whatever. You can choose to space them a little bit far apart because as we in the previous slide, the capacitance is not only to the ground but also to the adjacent wire. By placing the wires a little far away, you can at least reduce the adjacent capacitance and hence the overall capacitance. Because the overall capacitance is the sum of all the capacitances. So you can adjust the spacing of the wire, the width of the wire and the layer you want to use. In addition by micro architectural changes, you know how you place various things, you can adjust the length. So when you have that kind of, uh, then, then basically since the thickness is not there, sometimes you can use this rho by t as a constant called resistance per square, in which case the resistance is resistance per square times the number of squares of wire. So number of squares is the number of widths I can fit in a particular length. That is L by W. That's why it's called the number of squares. So this is a cross section of a chip, uh, of from an actual chip. Uh, what they have done is they have taken a cross section and they have taken a, a photograph probably through an electron microscope. And uh, you have, uh, so you might you might come across the term SEM photo, scanning electron microscopy image of this chip and uh, transistors are, are at the lowest layer and then you have various layers of metal, 8 layers of metal and progressively the metal thickness is increased as you go up higher in layer. Also the pitch is increased that means thicker metals you cannot place them as close as you would be able to place the thinner metals. So the M1 has very close uh, whereas the, the upper layers M4 and above are the minimum pitch, the minimum separation is much larger. 
vias are essentially vertical connection between different layers and uh, usually they will have a fixed geometry there will be a small square but you can put as many as you want you can't change the size of the square you can put as many as you want and you can use that to connect between different layers each via has quite a bit of resistance because they are really small so you want to be able to put uh, many of them to reduce the overall resistance capacitance is basically because of the electric field which happens between you know any pair of conductors and you not only have electric fields which are from the <coughs> you know along the vertical and lateral dimensions but also directions but also you have fields happening because you have These are called fringing fields, where from the side plate to the bottom plate, it's it's kind of a fringe, something on the side, and then that complicates the formula. It's no longer just epsilon area by d. You know, so you have to take the curvature and so on. So the formula, analytical formula, cannot become complicated. But uh, uh, so one thing you notice out here is that when we calculate the capacitance of a wire, we assume a worst case condition. That means there is a wire which has wires close to it on either side. As well as the top and bottom are conducting sheets. Okay, even though in reality you might not have this all the time, but this gives you the worst case capacitance, which you then use and for your uh, analysis. So the total capacitance is sum of all these capacitances. Okay, now if you see out here the wire is here, the pitch, which is the kind of the period of spacing of the wires, is W plus H, S. That is the pitch. W is the width of the wire, S is the separation. So the pitch is basically W plus S. And uh, usually the, the detailed capacitances are obtained by using some kind of 3D field solver, uh, solving the Maxwell's equations uh, to obtain the capacitance numbers. Now, how do we model a wire when you do circuit analysis? Right, because it's a distributed wire is a it's kind of a distributed entity unlike a transistor which is you know very small and you can think of a lumped model for a transistor incidentally even for the transistors when you increase the speed of operation perhaps you are doing rf or very high very high speeds where the frequencies are of the order of the transit time of the carriers then again the lumped model no longer works even for a transistor but anyway, coming back to the wires, the wires are long. So you can imagine every segment of the wire, maybe a small differential segment having a resistor and a capacitor. So you have now the whole wire, you can model it as a, a sequence of these resistor capacitor segments. Each segment probably is maybe a fraction of a micron or something. So that model as a lump model is good. But then you have too many of these, right? And even a millimeter, you will have like maybe a million of these. So that is not practical. So what can you do? So what you do is you break it up into smaller number of segments. And uh, because the more segments you have, more elements you have in your circuit simulator and the more time it will take for you to simulate, even though accuracy will be very high. So you want it to simulate fast yet be reasonably accurate. So what you typically do is you break it up into some number of segments. And each segment, of course, you have a choice of which, you know, different ways of modeling it. For example, the segment, say the, res the segment's resistance is R and resistance is C. RC could be an L type model or it could be a pi model where you take C and break it up into two pieces on either side or a T model. Both of pi and T are reasonably accurate for a smaller number of segments and usually you know you can kind of use a pi model and uh, 3 to 5 segments is basically good enough. More segments you put more will be accuracy but you know it will just take longer for you to simulate. So 3 segments is good enough sometimes even one segment if you are very interested only in some course values 
see no matter how many segments you put the the if you look at the 50% to 50% delay it will be the same it will come to rc by 2 okay you can do the calculation it will come to rc by 2 what will be different as you put more and more segments is the rise time the slew rate the more segments you put more accurate will be the the uh, the estimation of the actual waveform okay so which is very important for calculation of delay of the next stage the the rise time becomes very important for the calculation of delay of the next stage and hence uh, you want to use reasonable number of segments so we looked at this example where say you have a wire which is 1 millimeter with 100 microns per mic 100 milliohms per micron and 0.2 femtofarads per micron then for a millimeter of wire the resistance is 100 ohms because millimeter is 1000 microns capacitance is 0.2 so what i do is i'll break it up into three segments each segment will have a resistance of 100 by 3 the whole wire is 100 each segment will have 100 by 3 because there are three segments each segment will have a capacitance of 0.2 by 3 but that 0.2 by 3 i'll split it up into two pieces half will be on this side half will be on that side for the pi model so like that i'll have the three models of course you can choose to combine these two capacitances into a single capacitance because they are in parallel you just add up the two so this is how we will have the model for a long wire here is another example where you have two wires coming out and uh, what you do is you basically model each wire here they have chosen to model it as two segments uh, from here we cannot say whether it's l or pi model because it will look the same because they have combined the capacitances as, you know uh, at each node so <coughs> you have this model and then um, you know this is the model of the inverter essentially it is an ideal voltage source with a uh, resistor in series and uh, the delay from the input to the any of the node is calculated using the Elmore delay formula if you want to do hand calculation okay so uh, this you are quite familiar with now when you have a long wire you know because the resistance grows as the length of the wire rho l by a is the resistance capacitance is rho times w l by c is epsilon times w l by a so both of them grow linearly with the length so the rc product which is what determines the delay grows as square of the length of the wire and very quickly it will become very large so to deal with that people have come up with this concept of putting repeaters so what you do is you insert inverters at periodic distances you say you insert n repeaters you break up the wire into n segments of equal lengths and you put a resist a inverter in in front of each segment so now the delay becomes a delay n times the delay of a single segment so the question is how many do i put and what size do i use to uh, put this so uh, what we to solve that problem you know with whatever we have learned so far it's now pretty straightforward we basically put a model for the inverter and we have a model for the wire that way you get the delay as an analytical formula function of the size of the inverter and the length of the segment then once you have an analytical formula you just optimize it to get the values for the size and the number of segments because those are the two unknowns we need to figure out so here what we have done is we have taken a single segment and in a single segment we have the inverter driving the wire with the next segment as a, the inverter of the next segment as the load okay now you see this combination here is the model of the inverter okay normally we we'll, you know so what you have is you have a resistance the output resistance of the inverter which is rg by s because we have scaled the inverter by size s its output parasitic capacitance cd by s cd times s the input gate capacitance is important for the next stage not for this stage so but anyway i have just shown it here the input gate capacitance is cg by s but really this is the you know this inverter is driving the wire we, we have put a pi model and then the load of the next stage which is a gate capacitance cg times s okay we have used the same size inverter for all the segments so now we basically write the formula once we have formula for the delay of this segment and then we multiply it by n to get me the delay of the overall wire so delay of this segment is essentially just apply 
Elmore delay formula Rg by S times this capacitance which is Cd plus Cg times S plus the wire Cw times L by N. The wire is 1 nth. Cw is the resistance per capacitance per unit length. Rw is the resistance per unit length of the wire. And then this resistance times this capacitance. So Rw L by N times this capacitance which is Cw L by 2N plus Cgs. So I have just kind of uh, <coughs> here open the brackets and rewritten the expression and the overall delay now is n times the delay of each segment so you multiply by n and you get this term which is rg times cd plus cg times n if you think about it what is this see this delay is basically uh, every inverter has to drive its own parasitic plus the gate of the next guy so the size in some sense cancels out because you know if I increase my size, I increase my parasitic as well as increase the gate of the next guy because you are assuming all the inverters are of the same size. So it becomes like a parasitic quantity independent of the size except n comes in because the more I put more is the linearly grows. If you look at this term, this is RWL CG, uh, CGS okay what is this? This is basically it's like RWL is the resistance of the wire. The resistance of the wire times the gate capacitance of the inverter. That is the that is what this term is showing out to be. And then these are the two cross terms. That is this wire. Sorry, this this is the wire delay of a local segment. This is the delay from the resistor to uh, from the inverter to drive the wire. Okay. So now. What we do is, this was the exercise for you guys, probably some of you did, hopefully. Uh, basically you just minimize it, first differentiate the delay with respect to the size and put it to zero. So when you see what happens, these two terms are anyway independent of size, so only this and this term is there and you see this has a familiar form, 1 by x plus x. Minimum of 1 by x plus x is when 1 by x is equal to x, right, I mean that is the general form. So that's what we have is that at the optimum point this delay is equal to this delay. S soft is such that RW L C G times S soft is equal to R G C W L by S soft. So from there you get the optimum size. So the delay with the optimum size oh okay I uh, I skipped a step here. You plug that in and then you find the optimum n. Optimum n again you see it has the same form n plus 1 by n. I mean there are some constants again both will be equal. You equate it and you get the n. So again you get some square root kind of thing and we plug all of that in. Then you get the delay as a function of all these parameters and you see importantly delay is only linearly dependent on L now. It is not quadratically dependent only linearly dependent. That is a very important thing. If you did not put repeaters delay grows L square. Now it grows as L. Okay, so we are really reduce the delay quite a bit. Now it is kind of good to put delay as a function of you know delay per length. What is the delay per millimeter of wire right and then in do that uh, we will just reorder this expression you can kind of look at it in leisure but the point here is that uh, you know let us see so you have RWCW plus some factor out here. This factor is really dependent on CD by CG which is the relative ratio of the drain to the gate capacitance of an inverter. So that will be some constant specific to the technology. So here probably they have used 1. So 1 plus 1, 2, 2 plus 2, 4. No, this is, uh, uh, I do not know what value they have used but you get the, no, okay, so sorry. So, uh, the okay, and then RGCG is in some sense the, it, it's, if you recall the, uh, equation for delay of uh, any gate uh, we had tau times gh plus p okay now we are talking of inverters here so g is 1 and h is in some sense also 1 and p is some parasitic cd by cg and tau is there so rg cg is related to tau so the whole thing you can relate to the delay of a fan out 4 inverter what is the delay of a fan out 4 inverter phi tau right so just rewriting this in terms of fo4 you know these constants and whatever constants are required they get you know 
uh, adjusted so you get this equation 1.67 which is times f of square root f of 4 because this rgcg is within a square root times rwcd so this is the delay per unit length of a repeated wire okay and also from here what you see is l by n opt that means again these are some constants now if you see out here again the the one on the top is related to the basic technology inverter nothing to do with the sizing it's just technology of course the lower one rwcw depends on the wire different layers of metal will have different rw and cw so it will be a little different similarly different widths will have different impact right so rw cw in some sense is a function of the actual wire you use rgcg and rest of the things is essentially a technology dependent thing but what you see here is that l by n naught that means the length of a segment is again some kind of a constant so these two numbers are very good to know because you can of you know as a designer once you have an understanding for these numbers someone tells you okay when I mean, you know that you have a signal has to go from so many millimeters you say okay this is the delay per millimeter so i can expect this kind of delay you can't do better than that okay this is the best you can do d of by l is the best so it's good to have a notion of what is the picoseconds per millimeter similarly l by n naught it's like if i want the fastest delay what should be the length after which i need to put repeaters so again it will be you know you'll get some number maybe a half a millimeter or a millimeter or something then you know that okay if my wire goes beyond that i need to put a repeater i need to put a repeater so these are kind of two useful numbers to kind of extract for a technology both these numbers depend on rw cw CW is the wire capacitance per unit length. RW is the wire resistance per unit length. That depends on which layer of metal and the width of the metal. Because if I make the wires wider, RW will go down. CW will increase a little bit. So it really depends on the width of the metal. So in that sense, you know, D or L and so on can do depend on the exact wiring. But you can still get a reasonably good. You can kind of, for example, calculate this for a typical wire width. Okay, we'll see that in the next slide. So let's first look at what are some typical numbers. But before I do that, I want to show you uh, something called this ITRS roadmap. Okay, this is something very useful. ITRS is International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors. It's kind of a, a consortium of companies and some leading academy academia where they sit down and predict and you know what is the future of the semiconductor industry what are the problems what are the challenges what do we expect in the future so it becomes like a road map for companies and researchers in the area to try to meet that kind of a, a prediction and you can go to www.itrs.net and uh, from there you can have reports you know every every year they come up with a report 2011 report is available you click and you can download the reports now what do these reports look like okay so basically what you have is from this report i want to i want to kind of see the following you guys are going to graduate next year next year year after okay some of you might maybe they are second year students i don't know um Say, say 20, you start a chip design, say 2016, you are targeting a chip, a product to come out in 2016. Okay. So you want to know what to expect, what kind of performance, what will be the, you want to do some back of the envelope calculations. So that is where something like this roadmap becomes very useful. So you go to the website, you download the documents, there are various documents related to various aspects, wiring, document related to transistors, document related to testing, manufacturing, etc. Et All different topics are covered. So we will look at the document related to the interconnect. Okay. So <coughs> again, it's a very large document. I will not go through the whole document. You can kind of download and have a look. So what you have here is uh, along with the document, you also have some spreadsheets. Okay. So in the spreadsheet, uh, what is predicted is the, for that year what is the gate length which is drawn you know from the manufacturers right so mpu stands for microprocessors 
and logic chips. There are various kinds of chips. Microprocessor logic chips form one class of chips. Memories form other DRAMs form another class of chips. Flash memories form another class of chips. So they will have predictions for each class of chips. So let's look at for logic chips. So let's look at 2016. Okay, in 2016, you have printed gate length. That means when you draw the gate in your schematic tool, not schematic, the layout tool, it will be 20 nanometers. Okay, that's what you would use in your. Uh, you say it's a 20 nanometer technology. The gate length is 20 nanometers. Of course, that's what you draw. I mean, that's what you print. But physically, when it gets manufactured, the way it gets manufactured, the gate length is a little smaller. So for that, they are saying 15 nanometers. Now, why is this gate length kind of interesting for us? It turns out that there is a relationship, simple relationship between gate length and the fan out for delay. As a first cut, if I want to estimate the fan out for delay. Okay, I will say it is gate length divided by 3 in picoseconds. So, 20 nanometer means I will say I can expect the fan out for to be 20 by 3 picoseconds. 6.7 picoseconds is my fan out for delay. It is kind of a heuristic of the exact you have to simulate and see. There will be some variations. But for if you want to kind of get a ballpark number, this is what you will do. So, 6.7 picoseconds will be the delay for a fan out for loaded inverter. That means one inverter driving four copies of itself. That is what fan out 4 is. Why is that number important? Because we said minimum delay you get when your fan outs or the stage efforts are about 4. Okay, 3 and a half to 4, we cannot use the number 4 just because it is easier to talk about. Now, you see out here many parameters are given. These are all very interesting, especially if you are doing some modeling and you want to kind of see what will happen in the future and so on gate, dielectric leakage, metal, these might not be very clear to you, but I am just going to, you know, in, might not be clearly visible here, but I just want to show this. Let us see. Any other interesting things here? The other interesting thing is kind of the supply voltage. You see out here supply voltage they expect to be about 0.77. Okay, that is what they are predicting in 2016. And then the threshold voltage now, there are two kinds of transistors they make predictions for. One is high speed transistors. That means these transistors are used when you really want performance. And then there is low power transistor. The difference between the two transistors is really the threshold voltage. And there will be some processing difference, you know, but it's essentially got to do with the threshold voltage at the end of the day. The threshold voltage for this transistor is 0.25 volts, 250 millivolts. Okay, and for that you get a certain current and so on. Uh, but really, you see also the leakage is about 100 nanoamps per micron at room temperature, at a high drain bias. That means VDS is equal to VDD. Remember, when high VDS you have double and all that effect, all that is considered, and then you have 100 nanoamps per micron is what they would like to have. Similarly, you will have a low power transistor low power device which in 2016 the same everything will look the same except there is a separate implant to adjust the threshold and make the threshold higher when you make the threshold higher supply voltage will you know for low power operation you want to use the lower supply threshold voltage is um, off current is 10 nanoamps off current that means the gate is zero but VDS is there the sub threshold leakage current that was 100 nanoamps per micron for the high power device I mean high speed device 10 nanoamps one tenth so very low power operations you want to use these kinds of devices okay so so we have basically um, the FO4 delay that's what we got okay so now I want to see the wire what I want really to calculate is the delay per millimeter, picosecond per millimeter. That's what I want to know. I want to get a sense for where we are. So now let us look at these numbers. Again, they have predictions for the wiring also. So 2016. I think in my slide I probably use numbers from uh, 2014, but uh, but okay. Let's just go here because we can't see the left explanation. So there are a number of things out here. 
DRAM half pitch contacted. We'll ex I'll explain this when we discuss about DRAMs. Uh, metal pitch contacted. Uh, one and a half pitch. So what this is saying is, you know, when I have contacts, how close can I be? Uh, this is very interesting. Total interconnect length, metal per per centimeter square, meters per centimeter square. Metal one and five intermediate layers. So M1 till M6 or M7. 4167 meters per centimeter square. So that means one square centimeter, you have four kilometer of wiring. Okay, 4 kilometers of wiring is what they are expecting. Okay. Failure in time per meter. Failure in time is, again we will discuss this a little bit later, but how many, you know, how many things will fail in a particular time, maybe a year, how many entities will fail, you, want, you know, you have so, so much of wiring, 4 kilometer of wiring, you know, per unit length, per meter length we want to have only 1.4 failures. That means when I have 4000 meters, I need to have failure of only 4 times 4.1.4. About 5.6 uh, of these, suppose I were to think of this 4000 segments, I can allow only 5.6 of the segments to fail. Okay, failure could be short, open, etc, etc. That is the requirement they have put and prediction. Current density, how much current I can uh, send through it. Interlayer dielectric constant, effective dielectric constant, uh, interlevel metal insulator constant. So these, you see that dielectric of um, number of these things are put. Wiring pitch, okay, uh, 48 nanometer wiring pitch. That means I have W plus S is 48 nanometers. I, 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 yes, I did use 38. So I did use the right one. The 2016, the pitch is 38 nanometers. And the wiring half pitch, that is the, actually it turns out this is also the wire width is 19 nanometers. So 19 nanometers is the width of the wire. S is also 19 nanometers. So you have spacing of pitch of 38 nanometers for metal one. Okay. So we are looking at the red column. Aspect ratio. Remember, we saw this wires. Aspect ratio is kind of the height by width, how tall and how wide they are. Aspect ratio is 2. That means the wire height is twice the wire width. So, if I have 19 nanometer width, height is 19 times 2, 38 nanometers. So, these are tall wires. Okay. Barrier. <coughs> it turns out when you have copper, it is like you have to put a little barrier of uh, an insulator of some material to prevent the copper from etching out into the outside. Okay, so what that does is you had 19 nanometer of width, but some of the width is gone because now you have the barrier. So the barrier width is saying they are saying 1.7 nanometer. So it's like I have 19 nanometers, I have to take off 1.7 nanometer from each side, from left side, bottom, and the right side. Top I don't have to put a barrier, left, right, and bottom I have to put. So I have I've lost the width, okay. And then there are some other things, uh, let's see, the effective conductivity, including effect of width dependent scattering and conformal barrier of thickness specified below. So this is taking into account the loss of width due to barrier, the effective resistance is, resistivity is to 6.96 micro ohm centimeter. So, if I want to find the resistance of the wire, I have to now use this row. This is the row L by A. This is the row of row L by A. L will be whatever length, say 1 millimeter. A will be W times H. Okay. Where I have to find the width. W is given as 19. H is, I use the aspect ratio to get H 19 times 2. So, I know the area. Okay. Then I can use this and I calculate the resistance. Okay. And uh, I also have, they are also given capacitance per unit length of the metal wire. Now it has, it, it is a range 1.8 to 2 picofarads per centimeter which is also, uh, you know, you know, you see the range, this is the, let us look at this 38 and 39. This is the lower value, this is the higher value, there is some variation in the range. You see these values are almost constant. Across the years it is constant. It is about, if you were to say 2 picofarad per centimeter or 0.2 picofarad per millimeter. 
metal 1. So that is a good number. You can say what is the capacitance of metal 1, the minimum width. You are talking of minimum width. Well. Minimum width is changing. Every generation you are reducing the width. You are reducing the spacing. But capacitance per millimeter is remaining constant. Why is that? That is because for a given length, you have a certain area and a certain separation. When you take every, when you squeeze everything down, okay, so you are reducing the the length. Let us say the let us look at one side of the capacitance, one plate of the capacitance. We'll kind of ignore the fringing field. Let us look at one plate of the capacitance. The area of that plate is the length of the wire times maybe the width. Let us say, right? Length we are keeping fixed because we are calculating capacitance per unit length, per millimeter only we are calculating. So when I go to the next generation, let us say I scale everything by the same factor. The width will scale by same factor. Separation will also scale by the same factor. When that happens, they get cancelled out. So capacitance remains constant per millimeter. So that's what dielectric is also KF is 4.2 across the generations. Okay, that's what they are saying. K effective is the relative dielectric that is 4.2 okay now they calculate the interconnect delay rc delay for 1 millimeter so now you can actually use these numbers uh, and calculate and you will find that uh, you can find the r value resistance because you know the effective resistance resistivity 6.96 you know the area is w you know the w is 19 and thickness is 30, 38, you put all the numbers, you get a resistance, you multiply it with the capacitance RC, you get this number. In fact, you get this number. There are two numbers they have calculated. Uh, this one is ignoring the barrier, loss of uh, resistivity due to barrier. This is considering that you get basically this number 17.2, 17,200 picoseconds per millimeter. That is 17.2 nanoseconds per millimeter. Okay. This is the RC delay for metal 1. So this ITRS roadmap is very useful if you want to kind of do kind of hand calculations, product planning, etc. Because you know whenever you start embark on a design project, you know you have to target a technology, you know by the time you finish the design 2-3 years have gone, the hot technology at that time will be a little bit ahead, you have to see where things are going. So this kind of roadmap helps you to kind of place yourself you know kind of say where where is what is it that you need to target and you can go through this you know just look at this document and you'll find that you know the kind of formula they use and so on are very much what you have been looking so far, you know, what we have been studying. You see, this is the model they use for calculating the capacitance. The, in the table, there was this 0.2 picofarads per millimeter. This is how they calculate it. This, this appendix tells you what, what they are doing. So, um, let's go back to our calculation. So, we take the 20 nanometer process, which is in 2016. I did the calculations for RW using that number 6.96 uh, micro ohm centimeter and then I also use 19 nanometer as a width as was specified and aspect ratio was given as 2 so the height is 32 nanometer so the area is 19 times sorry 19 times 38 nanometer square and the length is 1 millimeter rho is 6.96 again from the table from there I get this number resistance of the wire per un millimeter for a metal one minimum width is 96 kilo ohms okay the capacitance of the wire again for minimum width and minimum pitch that's what they have given there it is 0.2 picofarads per millimeter now our fo4 delay is 6.67 picoseconds so delay per millimeter is uh, let's come back first delay without repeater per millimeter is 96k times 0.2 puff times 0.5 rc by 2 and more you know we have to kind of use that formula that comes to be actually it comes to be 8.6 nanoseconds i made a mistake here because i have a factor of 2 in the table in the itrs roadmap 
they have not used RC by 2 looks like they have just done R times C and that comes to 70.2 but if you use L mode you know really the delay is R times C by 2 so it is 8.96 so there is an error here but that is what it is but let us look at let us look at the delay when you put repeaters ok for that we will use the formula 1.67 times I have put 15 picosecond which is an error it should have been 6.67 picoseconds right times RW times CW ok so um, so I do not know why I did that let us see what I did actually ok I did do the right uh, calculation 20 by 3 so I did do the right number so here it is a typo so this is 6.67 picoseconds times 96k times 0.2 puff square root of that times <coughs> 1.67 is 597 picoseconds you look at it right this is this is 8.6 you know about 9 nanoseconds and when you do repeaters it comes to 0.6 nanoseconds dramatic reduction so you really have to use repeaters ok the other thing maybe you should calculate as an exercise is what is the repeated length L by N opt ok you calculate that I did not do that calculation and let us see what that number is it will be interesting to see what that number is so now let us see this length 597 I put repeaters how many FO4 delays is it it is 597 divided by 6.7 it is 90 FO4 delays that is a large number of FO4 delays. Say if you are doing a very high performance microprocessor, one pipe stage might have 14 FO4 delays. Okay, so here you have 90 to drive 1 millimeter of wire. That means it is like having 6 pipe stages in cycle. It is like it takes me 6 cycles to send an information a bit across 1 millimeter, one millimeter of the chip. Okay. As a contrast, let us look at the speed of light. Suppose I used, you know, you cannot exceed speed of light speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 10 centimeters per second in vacuum here the directly someone pointed out we may saw it is 4.2 k effective so speed of light is speed of light in vacuum divided by square root of mu epsilon ok so square root of 4 is 2 so 15 so 3 into 10 to the 10 by 2 which is 5 1.5 into 10 to the 10 centimeters by per second when you plug that in you get 6 picosecond per minute so we are really slow compared to speed of light ok 6 you know 600 100 times slower now how do we break this barrier you know, it is too slow 600 picosecond per millimeter is too slow so what you have to do is you go back to the formula you have RW and CW those are the two things you have to play around with there is nothing else you can do so you have to reduce the RW and CW how do I reduce RW I I have to if I stick to a particular layer I have to use a wider wire and then if I can use a higher la layer because the higher layers have more thickness the resistance will be lower so the longer if I want to go large distances I have to go up the layer stack and use wider wires CW I can reduce again by going to upper layers and then increasing the spacing at least I can reduce the capacitance to the adjacent wires. I can't reduce the capacitance to the top and bottom, but at least to the adjacent. And if I'm really paranoid, maybe top and bottom also. Remember this capacitance number was calculated assuming there is some metal sheet on top, the next layer above, and metal sheet next layer below. Certain critical signals, if you are really speed dependent, you can say don't put anything on top and bottom. Let it be clear so that you have the least capacitance. So using that, you can get down the speed maybe RW can come down in fact the global wires have RW which is one third of this and uh, by increasing the width you can maybe get it down quite a bit uh, maybe a factor of 6 perhaps 100 picosecond per millimeter I think that is a reasonable speed to target 100 picosecond per millimeter for repeated uh, wires which are using optimized wires higher layer metal reasonable widths etc etc ok
so now you see the 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 wires are really an important uh, component which you have to take into account when you design a chip it has to be part of the uh, chip design in fact um, various architectural solutions have been suggested to deal with this for example people say let us break up a chip into small modules maybe module is about a millimeter across then then now you think of spreading the computation across these different modules with uh, having a <coughs> because you have repeaters each repeater perhaps could be a little bit more with a switch and so on so many uh, interesting uh, microarchitectural solutions have been proposed to work around uh, this problem of uh, increased delays of wires besides delay another aspect one has to consider is problem of cross talk which is also comes under the topic of signal integrity how good is the signal you send a signal 0 to 1 or 1 to 0 how what is the quality of the signal at the receiving end here what we are taking is two wires we are taking a cross section the wires are going into the slide a and b you have capacitance to ground and at capacitance between the wires this adjacent capacitance is the problem because it induces coupling from one wire to the other when there is a transition in one wire some signal gets injected into the other wire due to this coupling capacitance and you see the effective cap coupling capacitance really depends on the direction of uh transition i mean let us look at the capacitance of the wire a okay it has a capacitance we are ignoring the capacitance on the left side and on the top side but just for illustration purposes so suppose so the effective capacitance seen by the driver on a really depends on what is happening on b okay let us say b is constant there is a driver which is constantly keeping it at a particular voltage value then you can think of it as b being connected to ground essentially in which case the capacitance seen at a is c ground plus c adjacent because b is effectively an ac ground okay but let us say b switches in the same direction as a when that happens while a is switching b is also switching the same direction in in the ideal case whatever is the voltage at a voltage at b is also the same in time domain that means you will have never have any current flow across this so this capacitance is out of the picture it's not affecting the transition of a so a is capacitance the driver of a will just have to drive capacitance of c ground whereas say the opposite happens a is going say rising and b is falling then you will have much effective capacitance will be twice c ground times 2 c at the same but really if you want to take a step lower to analyze this what you have to do is the current across the capacitance is given as c times dv by dt right c adjacent times dvab by dt now if va is increasing by a certain rate vb is reducing by a certain rate you can calculate what is the derivative and that is the instantaneous current being drawn right so the instantaneous currents across this capacitance actually in some essentially depends on the rate of change faster rate of changes means faster more is the current which is being drawn but in terms of charge overall charge uh which a supply has to provide it has to provide a charge of c ground plus 2 c adjacent times v that is the amount of charge it has to provide so this effect the factor of 2 is also the another name for that is the miller factor this is a miller effect okay so because of the miller effect this capacitance impact is magnified you might have studied this in analog circuit design where you have this miller effect uh where you have a capacitance across an amplifier and the effect of the capacitance is the gain of the amplifier times that capacitance right so that is basically what we have here so when you have a wire with another wire next to it and let us say you know there are the terminology used in this uh kind of analysis is aggressor and victim there is an aggressor whose signal is changing and it causes a disturbance in the victim if the victim is a floating wire then that disturbance can be calculated based on capacitance dividence formula capacitance divider formula right 
you have a series capacitor if this changes by voltage delta v you have series capacitor you have voltage division and you can calculate the formula and this is what you'll get the the if this goes by a certain step delta v this will increase by an amount c adjacent by c ground plus c adjacent okay so if c adjacent is very very large then delta victim will be almost the same as delta v adjacent whereas if c ground is very very large compared to c adjacent then the coupling will be less the coupling effect is different when you have the victim also driven by some just imagine the victim is connected to a perfect ground or a perfect vdd then aggressor cannot change it at all because by definition it's connected to ground or vdd that means the victims the driver resistance the whatever is driving the victim has a resistance of zero let us say in ideal case then you cannot budge the victim he will be whatever voltage that is there right so that is why you see whereas when the victim is not connected to anything not anchored then the victim will get uh <coughs> disturb the maximum so that kind of comes up in this equation here where you have the delta victim the the noise coupling on victim is related to noise on the aggressor but now it is a modulation factor 1 by 1 plus k where k is the relative time constant of the aggressor and the victim so if the victim's time constant if r victim is zero okay tau victim is zero k is infinity k is infinity delta victim is zero so when r is zero delta v is zero which is what we expect because it's very tightly connected to that particular voltage whereas when k is zero it will have the maximum value everything in between is kind of uh, other values are in between and it depends on the relationship of tau aggressor to tau victim because you see that these are capacitors and capacitance impedance of the capacitance really depends on the the frequencies right omega c 1 by j omega c so if the aggressor is very slowly raising rises very very slow slowly then you know let us say it rises slowly slowly and this there is some coupling but the victim time constant is so small that it just before you notice it's kind of just absorbed so that is why the there is a relative time constants which comes into the effect so what is the impact of this right now of course one impact is that you know when you have a aggressor switching if there is some coupling on to the victim and especially if the victim is floating then the victim's voltage will change and if there is a receiver on the other end maybe there is an inverter or some logic gate it might interpret that as some signal and switch and it, you might have bad things so first thing is you should try to avoid floating signals because floating signals our victim is infinity it will pick up the most amount of noise of course there are times when you can't avoid it but most of the time you should try to avoid if possible because they really pick up noise okay now so you have avoided it and you have put a driver and let us say driver is also very good so the you know because when you put a driver when the aggressor changes there will be some voltage on victim it will change by some amount but eventually it will die down because you have a driver which is driving it to some particular voltage we have shown it as ground here it can also be vdd it will go back to its logic value but there will be a little blip what is the impact of the blip if the blip is too much it will you know if the following stage is just some logic stage that stage might also switch and so on you might have a what are called glitches glitches are these very short pulses which will just lead to perhaps extra power dissipation okay of course if a glitch happens at the wrong time when you are sampling right your pipe stage your clock comes you are sampling if that time a glitch happens you sample the wrong value okay so there could be that kind of a problem but say you take it that into account and you make sure our victim is reasonably small so the glitch even if it happens is small enough that it doesn't it is less than the vil vih of the next stage 
that is why you see now we have this notion of VIL, VIH and the noise margins become important. But, but then still what happens? Now let us say in the victim you have a signal which is switching. If the signal in the victim is switching in the opposite direction to that of the aggressor, then the, see you have the Miller effect coming into picture. Effective capacitance between victim and aggressor doubles because of C adjacent doubles. So the victim signal becomes slower. You did all your RC delay calculation, you assume something, but now it is slower. So that is why when we do RC calculation, we assume. See, we assume the C adjacent in the C, but now it becomes two times C adjacent. So the delay of that signal has slowed down because the person next to it is switching in the opposite direction. Now you have this, you can say, okay, why don't I always assume two times C adjacent and assume all the time the guy next to me is switching. That can become a very conservative design. You know, you can end up because you get two times C adjacent, you get a certain delay for the wire. Based on that, you assume, you do your repeater insertion, you calculate driver sizes, everything you have to make big. You, everything becomes very conservative because you are thinking that the worst things will happen. So you end up making a bigger chip, bigger power dissipation, then you know you might not be competitive anymore. On the other hand, you say, okay, forget it, man. I'll not worry. <laughs> then when it really hits you, your chip might not work because you designed it and then that particular instance, some combination of input patterns is causing aggressor and the victim to go in opposite direction just for that particular pattern and then this flows and then you at that speed it doesn't work. So it can be a very tricky thing. So this analysis of, uh, this, is, this comes in the domain of signal integrity analysis where again because of the volumes of the nets, you, know, you can have millions of nets. Again you have to have automated approaches to do this kind of analysis and tell you and warn you, okay, you know, this is okay or, you know, this kind of thing is going to happen because based on the patterns you are using, you have to kind of see whether you will end up with these kinds of problems. But you see this again a very challenging analysis problem. How can you deal with this? See, there are cases where you have, it's very critical and you know that, you know, you can't afford to have this kind of non-determinism. You don't know. Sometimes it can happen. Sometimes you, know, you, you want to be very clear. because it's really critical, very high speed path. Say you have a bus. One thing you can do is you can put these shield wires. Okay. So that way you reduce the cross stop. Because whenever you have power and ground, so the ultimate is every wire has its own power and ground next to it. Then what happens is that the field lines from A1 will not go to A0 because the ground and VDD will absorb the field line, most of the field lines, the electric field lines. So you won't have coupling. Okay. So putting ground and VDD, these are called shields, right? They, uh, that is the best way to isolate signals. You can actually make a complete Faraday cage. You have this wire, you can have the two adjacent wires and the one and have something running on the top and the bottom, all power or ground. So this wire becomes fully caged, you know, it's like nothing can disturb it. But you see the cost, you have, you know, you have lost so much area. But maybe some very, very sensitive, some very specific places you might want to do it. So the cost is, I have lost you know, efficiency. Efficiency is, you know, how many signal per cross-sectional millimeters I can send. Here, if you say, when I say cross-section, I mean, I cut across like this. In this distance from here to here, I am able to send only three signals. Whereas, if I didn't have VDD ground, I could have sent seven signals. So, I have lost my wiring efficiency. So, this is the extreme. Maybe you can do something intermediate. But maybe you can do something you know, depending on the situation, maybe you have two buses, A and B, and you kind of know that both of them are not switching at the same time. So they interleave. Maybe one goes to the register file to fetch the data, other comes from the register file. So their timings are different, right? You are sending address and the data comes, things like that. So yeah, for that you really have to understand your design to do that kind of tricks. It can't be done in general. Pardon? Okay, so 
um, the question is um, what happens when the signal directions are opposite now when that happens it is indeed the case that when they meet there is only a small region where both are transitioning at the same time <coughs> so in that small region you will have enhanced capacitance effects but otherwise it will be ok uh, that is true but as far as delay degradation goes that is true but as far as the cross talk in terms of injecting noise you will still have a problem the problem will be as before but in terms of delay impact it will be less that is right so th this is again an example where understanding the physical characteristics what is happening what is cross talk why it happens you can you know try to improve it right if you just sit at the level of writing verilog code or vhdl code then you don't know right i mean something like this unless you understand what is going on you cannot really optimize for it and you might have to intervene tell the tool what to do and so on because the tool itself might also not know which two buses are it will not have any idea right but with your knowledge you can of your design so the knowledge of the higher level also is important knowledge of the lower level also is very important to really optimize the design you know you can try to cancel noise you know for example uh, here what is being done is the repeaters are staggered so when that happens if this piece of wire and you look at this piece of wire the you know here the polarity at the input and output are opposite so in opposite signals are getting injected so the the effective noise coupling is reduced here they are intentionally injecting noise of the opposite direction okay out here in this so you have this wire and then you have this wire and then you have some coupling but then here you in intentionally inject noise of the opposite direction now you know some of these uh, you know i'll be very kind of skeptical and careful about these kinds of things because uh, it can very easily go wrong <laughs> okay so if you don't have the right matching out here it's kind of difficult so you know i mean these are interesting ideas to keep in mind but well, how practical they are you have to actually uh, you know you have to kind of uh, it's not immediately apparent that it's easy to make it to work this is something which is uh, very easy to make to work and it's done a lot of times this twisting business you see here these are signals which are differential that means you have signal and its complement okay so the here you know we'll kind of see when you see some st logic styles you have signal and its complement available and when you want to send it across uh, you basically twist the wire so what happens is that every wire spends equal amount of time with every other wire here for example v bar the the length of coupling of v bar to a is this distance plus this distance let us say this total length is l this is l by 2 this is l by 4 l by 4 okay so then the v bar is next to a for l by 4 here and l by 4 here which is l by 2 <coughs> and uh, v is also next to a for oh sorry sorry i, I made a mistake v bar is next to a for l by 4 and next to a bar for l by 4 v is next to a for l by 4 and also next to a bar for l by 4 so v and v bar are and a and a bar are next to each other for equal distances so effective coupling value is the same so again this is another trick which is again a layout trick which you have to do to what you are doing is you are not reducing the you are kind of not reducing the overall coupling but you are making sure the coupling is the same to both v and v bar with the hope that the receiver is looking at difference in v and v bar as opposed to just v by itself or v bar by itself yes yes pardon 
this kind of thing exactly so really these kinds of things are useful when the signals are very low voltage signals for example in memories you will have this low voltage signals are used to communicate information maybe long buses to reduce power you use small swings so this is where you would apply this kind of concept okay so this is all i had today any questions okay the question is how does the b scheme work in the b scheme what is happening is that uh basically when the when a signal has a certain polarity here let, let us say it is falling it injects a negative going signal onto this wire the victim but what they do is they have this inverter to create a positive going signal on the op out output of the inverter which gets coupled through this capacitor so the negative going signal coming from this wire is getting cancelled by the positive going signal from the because of the inverter that is kind of what is happening here also the negative going signal is there is a positive going signal both are getting injected here the inverters are anyway part of the wire perhaps as part of as the repeaters here there is no repeaters but they separately put these of course if these capacitors don't match then it doesn't it will not perfectly cancel it it's extra area extra power all of that is there see the uh, what happens actually is that uh, it turns out that uh, you know when you have a piece of wire you don't have multiple edges in transit okay we don't pipe we don't pipeline wires okay so that problem doesn't come into the picture but if you had something like a transmission line then you can have multiple clock edges in transit 